Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com, and you're back for our episode on the Lafayette apron, or is it aprons, as there are essentially three Masonic aprons, all being attributed to the one and only Marquis de Lafayette. He's probably one of the most famous French Freemasons, but... Our guest this week is probably one of the most famous non-Freemasons to be on our podcast as we welcome back the uh, board-certified psychiatrist and author of Brought to Light, the Mysterious George Washington Masonic Cave, Dr. Jason Williams. Welcome back, Dr. Jason. Michael, it is so nice to be back. Thank you for inviting me again. It's just It, it tickles me to be here. Well, it's a pleasure for me, as I've told you, as traveling and talking with Lodge Brothers, I say, he's my favorite profane guest. (laughs) Masons will get that and outsiders will be like, he doesn't swear. No, no, it's just a term that we use for people outside of Freemasonry. And Dr. Jason has a wealth of uh, expertise and knowledge. And as we're talking about the Marquis de Lafayette, and there's a lot of questions on whether he was made a Freemason in France or raised to the sublime degree of a master Mason in a military lodge in New Jersey, there's no question that he had a strong relationship with brother George Washington. Can you give us a little overview of Lafayette and maybe a, a perspective because a lot of us may only know him from, you know, names of counties, town squares, or parks. Right. Uh, that's very true. You know, it's a name that's ubiquitous, you know, in front of the white house everywhere that you'll see the name Lafayette. And I think most Americans still do know a little bit about him, you know, he played had a big role in, you know, if you've seen Hamilton, you probably remember him in that. Um, and and everyone knows he kind of had this role, but sort of the Masonic angle to Lafayette and how that how he got involved. It's actually it's almost like a Hollywood blockbuster more than a uh, uh, a uh, play on on Broadway, to be honest. Um, so Lafayette was obviously French, and he was a nobleman, um, and he was always one of the richest guys in France. And uh, he came to the United States in 1777 of his own accord. Uh, But how he got here itself is just quite the tale. Um, And there's quite a Masonic underpinning to it, uh, story to it. Um, So, you know, he he eventually uh, earned this title hero of both worlds or two worlds because he played a role in our revolution and also in the French Revolution. But when he was still a teenager, think of it, he was George Washington's youngest general. He was 19 years old when he did this. Mm. So um, his dad died when he was just two years old. His father served in the Seven Years' War, which over here we called the French, still called the French and Indian War. And his father died when he was just two years old. And he was very... um, you know, intrigued by Enlightenment ideas. And, and there definitely is proof that he became a Freemason in France. I've seen, you know, at the Grand Orient Lodge in Paris, I've been there and I've seen the actual physical documentation in, in 1775. Uh, he joined at the Lodge of St. Jean de la Candure in Paris. Um, and that was kind of a, a difficult time to be a Freemason. Just several decades, three, four decades before the Catholic Church and Lafayette was Catholic, right? Mm. So the, the Catholic Church had told all of its members, you cannot be Freemasons. And uh, they the words in, in the, the Catholic bowl, the, the, the bowl put out by the, the Pope was Freemasonry is depraved and perverted, right? And so in many countries in Europe, it was actually rather dangerous to be a Freemason or belong to other so-called secret societies. Um, not so much in France. In fact, um, quite a few French uh, persons, men uh, and women, uh, became Freemasons. And at, at around the time that he became, Lafayette became a Freemason, there were 600 lodges in France. So, and the government knew where they were. And so it's not like it was a, an underground movement uh, like World War II or anything like that. Um, But, you know, it was not easy to be a Freemason. He joined um, a a Paris Lodge in 1775. And um, that same year, he happened to go to a dinner party. And it's quite the dinner party because the guest was a British Freemason named 
Gloucester or the Duke of Gloucester. And he was the youngest brother of guess who? King George III, right? The very guy that George Washington had just started a war against over in America. And Lafayette gives this account that he was at this dinner party and hearing about this American general. He had never been to America, didn't even speak uh, English, but he, he heard this account um, of by uh, uh, Gloucester of George Washington fighting for liberty and independence against the, the cruel uh, King George III. And it just struck him like, hey, I want to go before he says, before I even left the table, I had already um, committed to the effort like this was happening <laughs> mm. and and so you know he's 19 he's got a lot of wealth because he you know he's a a noble guy with a very you know rich family and his father is gone right so um and um what's interesting is that even though Gloucester was a freemason the guy who told him about all of this king george the 3rd was not a freemason right and so king george the 3rd had three younger brothers all three of them were Freemasons, and they were all made past Grand Masters at the Premier Grand Lodge of England uh, in 1767. There was a big ceremony. King George III was not a Freemason. So anyway, um, after this dinner party that night, Lafayette had it, this idea, I'm going to America, and I'm going to do whatever I can to help George Washington, right, and, and his fight. I'm going to offer my services. And he met up with another uh, Freemason named Johann de Kalb. Uh, who's a Bavarian, and with the help of Silas Dean, a very interesting figure in, in the history as well, um, helped connect these men along with Ben Franklin, who was over in Europe as well. They helped sort of recruit and, and um, uh, act as a conduit for these European Freemasons to come to America, men like Lafayette. Now, others had already come to America. George Washington was kind of getting sick and tired of it because most of these young whippersnapper French noblemen who were coming to America just wanted more fame. And they were not really looking uh, to uh, advance the cause of liberty. And uh, Lafayette was very different. Anyway, he, he got his own ship. He called it Victory. Nice name. And um, the French were told by the British, France was still neutral at the time, right? And so, but the British told France, you better not let him flee to America um, and so the French, under the King Louis the Sixteenth, arrested Lafayette, um, and he escaped from jail. Was able to board his ship with, I think, a dozen or a couple dozen of his men, and with a couple British warships in hot pursuit, was able to escape France and made it to the open ocean. Wow! Right? So not to jump on here, but <laughs> just hearing you describe this, I'm thinking, you know. Hollywood is out of movie ideas. <laughs> Who needs it when you have this? Because I'm thinking of, you know, Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon barely escaping the, <laughs> the Republic. And, <laughs> right. and also the parallels with um, Lafayette's story. I wasn't aware of it. A lot of it is close, as you mentioned, to like other would-be American patriots that came from European uh, Europe, like Thaddeus Kuskusko uh, from Poland, who never became a Freemason, or there's very loose information if he ever did. But I'm just curious, like in your mind, George Washington was interacting with a 19-year-old kid, basically. How do you envision the first meeting between Washington and Lafayette? Lafayette landed in South Carolina. As soon as he got there, he sent some letters back to France because he left his young wife and, and, and an infant daughter there. So he sent, posted some letters back to France, bought some horses, and rode all the way up to Philadelphia where George Washington and the Congress were, right? And so he presents himself to Congress and he says, here I am. And they, they said, okay, you are a major general and we're gonna go meet, you know, introduce you to George Washington. And, and I mean, it's, it's not just what I think, it's kind of fortunately, so fortunately, Lafayette left really detailed notes and letters and so did Washington about their relationship. There are a lot of ex letters exchanged and, and Lafayette was writing back to his wife in France, describing how noble uh, George Washington appeared. And and, and uh, uh, I could even read a little passage. He said, the majesty, this is when he first met, this is when Lafayette first met Washington. The majesty of his figure and his height were unmistakable. His affable and noble welcome was no less distinguished. 
and I accompanied him on the inspections of the defenses. And uh, it was with such simplicity that we became two friends, united um, uh, and, and with like a, like a cement by the, the, the greatest of causes. So he sort of idolized Washington. Washington, of course, is like, wait, you have actually no military experience whatsoever. Right. So Washington was very skeptical. But guess what? It only took two weeks until Washington appointed Lafayette his aide or aide de camp. OK, and that's because it rapidly mm. Lafayette showed like, no, I'm, I want to be in the midst of the fight, the, the worst part of the battle right next to you. I'm going to do this at my own, own expense okay. and I'm not going to ask any questions and I'm not going to complain. So it, Washington went from very skeptical to within literally a couple months to this is my adoptive son. It does give that vibe because you have a 40 year old Washington and like almost a 20 year old Lafayette. And at first you'd be like, who's this French guy with money <laughs> that's coming here and wants to follow me along. And now it's like, oh, he's also a brother and he wants to fight alongside of me. Well, let's let him do this. Washington never had any kids of his own, of course. And he's like 43 at this point. Lafayette lost, lost his father when he was two years old. So it's almost like a match made in heaven from that standpoint. And so, but then at the Battle of Brandywine Creek, Lafayette was shot through the left calf, right, by a, a British musket ball. And Washington, it's documented in a letter that Washington gave to his uh, favorite physician, uh, James Craig, who was also a big Freemason involved with Washington's life. He told Dr. Craig, look after, look after him as after my own son, all right? And so, and not only that, we see that Washington had a portrait painted of Lafayette. Well, a lot of people had portraits painted in during the right in the midst of the Revolutionary War. But what's different different here is Washington had that portrait of it's a beautiful portrait of the Marquis in a Continental Army uniform. He had the painting brought to Mount Vernon and hung during the war and hung on the uh, the uh, the family room wall at Mount Vernon, as if this is really a family member, right? And he didn't do that mm. with other, you know, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, very close with Washington. No, Washington didn't do that. It wasn't that kind of really father son relationship that Washington and Lafayette had. Uh, you know, it, during the Valley Forge uh, winter, seventeen seventy seven, very brutal times. You know, a lot of disease and not enough food. And, you know, Lafayette was right there. Interestingly enough, guess who else was right there during the, the bleakest moment of the Revolutionary War? Martha Washington, right? She wasn't back at Mount Vernon. She was with George Washington uh, uh, at, at all of his winter encampments. She's there with him side by side. That's just very remarkable. Mm. How did Alexander Hamilton feel about Lafayette having this relationship with Washington? Because Hamilton really wanted to be George Washington's right hand man as well, right? You know, there were there was a lot of backstabbing going on and rumor mongering between Washington's own, um, you know, allies, the people that mm. Washington was closest to. In fact, um, I, one of the the quotes is that um, you know this is from Lafayette writing back to his wife, Washington trusts me deeper than I dare say. Uh, in the place he occupies, he is surrounded by flatterers and secret enemies. Right. So that's what Washington is up against. Michael, I don't want to uh, get get too far astray in this. But, you know, as far as like Freemasonry and the American Revolution and how much did it contribute and how much didn't it contribute? And I don't I forget if we mentioned this last time, but in my encounters with Masons, there are some that sort of over accentuate the involvement of Freemasonry in the American Revolution. And then there are some that that are like completely deny it. They're like, oh, no, it's all overblown. It didn't happen. There's no evidence of it. It's it's a bunch of it's it, all it is, is more of the slandering or, or mislabeling of Freemasonry getting into to sort of the uh, the esoteric and like the conspiracy theories. And so they sort of like downplay <laughs> um, uh, Freemasonry's involvement. However, here's Lafayette's mm -hmm. words about um, this is a letter that Lafayette wrote about George Washington. Um, a, a quote, I, he never willingly gave independent command to officers who were not Freemasons. 
right? Nearly all the members of his official family, as well as most other officers who shared his innermost confidence, were his brethren of the mystic tie, end quote. And, and so now only 50% or 46, there have been like studies done, counted up how many of Washington's generals mm. were Freemasons. And they, they somebody counted up and said, well, only 46%, right? And it's also true that m many of these generals were not handpicked by Washington. They were sent to Washington by Congress, right? So it's not like there's this giant conspiracy and George Washington was the leader Freemason and it's all, it's not like that. But here's Lafayette, who is George Washington's like adoptive son saying, hey, he didn't give orders to anyone or probably not at least important orders unless that person could be trusted. They were a Mason. That's it. If we can't believe Lafayette, I don't know who we can believe because he was there. This, uh, you know, apron gifted to Washington by Lafayette. There's been a great deal of confusion um, about which one is the true Lafayette apron. And there are several that have kind of staked the claim and saying we have it. OK, so, uh, for example, there's an apron that um, that belongs to the Alexandria Lodge. Right. And they think they for many years thought we have the, the Lafayette apron. Right. The Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. They thought they had obviously one apron can't be in three different locations at once. Somebody's got to <laughs> right. be right. And, and so, you know, there's another apron in the Grand Lodge of New York that um, is called the Lafayette apron. Let's that's the low hanging fruit. Let's get that one out of the way. That's clearly a transfer printing apron on leather. That kind of apron didn't get popular until the early 1800s. So that's mm -hmm. not the apron. And, and, and um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a beautiful apron, but it was probably part of the celebrations of when Lafayette came back to America in 1824 for the final time. It, you know, he had uh, a big celebration with the Grand Lodge. There's also the Grand Lodge of, uh, of New York has a, a, a really interesting apron. If you go back and it's not even on their website. You have to go back into old historical books. It's a triangular shaped apron that is supposed to be a Knights Templar apron that Lafayette had right. uh, and wore when he was initiated in, as a Knight Templar. And that's another Lafayette apron, lots of Lafayette aprons. Um, but point being, the, the, the one that New York has, they admit it themselves. No, it's not even the right time period. Okay. Mm. Um, the one that the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania has is also not the right time period. It's been for many years they claimed it was until they examined the material and they realized, oops, this material came from China. I was just going to joke about that. What did I have a made in China <laughs> label? No, there was, but but it was you know it's, it's not the the material was not from France and it was also printed mm. on right now the 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 two aprons that I want to talk about next are silk aprons. They're not cotton. They're not leather. They are silk, as in not mm. cheap, right? And they are embroidered with really fancy gold threads and sequins uh, of the style <laughs> that is right for French Freemasonry aprons of the 1700s. So the style is a lot more. Now, so, but there are two. There's the one that Mount Nebo had, which we'll call the Lafayette apron, because that's what it's been, de been determined to be. And then there's this other apron that the Alexandria Lodge has, and for many years claimed to be the Lafayette apron, and they look remarkably similar. Mm. The Lafayette apron that's in West Virginia, currently housed in West Virginia, uh, like I said, it's silk. It's got old Masonic emblems on it. You know that are the you know there are crossed French and American flags, which make it pretty clear that it was related to France. Um, it has uh, a skull and crossbones in the middle of it, as sort of the the central um, uh, emblem. Uh, which I believe means sort of like uh, belief in the afterlife, not 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 like poison. Right, and it, that's also a very prominent French Masonic symbol. You know, it has the square and compasses, of course, and it has a, a sprig of sprig of acacia, which also means like e eternal life, I believe. 
Um, and it, it has a gavel hanging from the top, which if I'm not mistaken, sort of implies like whoever wore this apron had some authority and was probably even the master of a lodge. The back of it is black um, silk. Uh, the, front, the front is, and it had a black trim around it, still does. And, uh, and, and it's very colorful. Um, uh, now there's this other apron that also was from France. This is the apron that the um, lodge in Alexandria um, has, and it's now referred to as the Watson Kasul apron. Watson was an American businessman and Kasul was a Frenchman, and the two of them were spies of George Washington's and they they during the war. And they were in cahoots together, and they were also, you know, the person above them was Ben Franklin, right? And so after, you know, in, in, in 1784, they um, had some nuns in a convent in France make a Masonic apron for George Washington. We even have Washington's letter of thanks to them. And we also have a letter from um, the, the gentleman Kasul describing, the, you know, some of the details of the apron. So we know that that apron is actually theirs. But there are some, some very remarkably similar um, features and styles uh, between these two aprons, the one in, in West Virginia, the Lafayette apron, and this other one, the Watson Kasul, it's also silk. It's the same size. It's the same shape. Um, and it also has the French and American flags crossed, but it does not have a skull and crossbones as its main symbol in the center. Instead, what it has is a, a, um, a gold plate with the uh, Hebrew uh, tetragrammaton on it, the four uh, Hebrew words, uh, yeah, words that basically mean the God of Israel. And it has some angels around it and stars, but it also has the gavel above it and a sort of a festoon of, of the, um, uh, the cable toe as well above it. So there, that's just like on the other um, Lafayette apron. So they look very similar. And what's interesting is when Lafayette came back to the Alexandria Lodge in, in 1824, when he was an old man, um, and they, the, the lodge in Alexandria showed it to him and said, oh, do you remember this apron that you gave Washington? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. No, it was the wrong apron. That was my next question is like, I would love to have known, I'm sure there was an official presentation, but was... Were the aprons that Washington was given from Lafayette, or the apron, I should say, that he was given from Lafayette, was that a apron that Lafayette had made for him? You kind of had alluded that it was given by the Grand Lodge of France, maybe. The history that we have that was handed down in the Washington family and also Washington's home lodge in Alexandria is that it was crafted by uh, Adrian Lafayette, who is the Marquis's wife. Wow. Interestingly, somewhere along the lines, the, the two aprons got crossed. Their paths got crossed, I should say. And so the, um, and, it, and it may have even been Washington who made the mix up, okay? So he put the, the apron that the French and American spies, not the Lafayette apron, but the Watson Kasul apron, he put it in the box that Lafayette gifted his to. Hmm. And then the other apron had a different course of history. What happened is after Washington died in 1799, they, uh, there was a huge inventory of the state. Mm. Not only that, there's an oil cloth or an er early trestle board that was in Washington's possessions. And that's all detailed in, in his estate listing of everything that he owned, all of his knickknacks and you know all the belongings that were important to him. And then Martha Washington died just a couple years later. And after Martha died, Mount Vernon had essentially a garage sale. I can't believe that you're going to go. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to say that. Gee. <laughs> so oh. now a, a lot of a lot of Washington's belongings were spelled out in his will, right? So a lot of things had were you know very dictated, like who gets this and that. But then there were a lot of things that were it was not clear who was going to get what, mm. right? And there was a tremendous, I assume there still would be a tremendous interest in anything that Washington had, had ever touched. So, you know, bedpans and tea caddies and things that normally would no one would want to, you know, own, you know, people showed up 
to bid. It was more like an auction than. Oh, than I bet. Yeah, auction. I just I have this awful picture <laughs> in my head, but hopefully I'm praying that like Lodge Brothers and from what I've heard taking the tour at the George Washington uh, National Masonic Museum is that Martha gave a lot of artifacts or donate a lot of artifacts to the lodge because she didn't want to have them in the house as a reminder of his presence. Right. And and so a lot of those artifacts are in good safekeeping at, at the George Washington Memorial in Alexandria. If anyone hasn't gone, if any Masons haven't gone, that should be like a bucket list Masonic uh, visit for any Freemason. So if we're to have a takeaway guide for brothers or just listeners that may come across one of these three <laughs> Lafayette aprons that exist. In your mind, the, the key things from what I understand for it to be an actual Lafayette would have been presented from Lafayette to Washington is look for the ornate decorations that would have been on a silk apron. And most likely, um, you would not find these on display in a place that you could go visit. They would only come out for special appearances, I'm guessing. After the Mount Nebo Lodge brought out the apron, they rolled it out in 2009, and it was verified by the authorities, which it should have been, and I'm thankfully it was. And a conservation um, uh, endeavor was put together as well to conserve it because the apron – you know, it's made of silk, and silk is not exactly the strongest, most stain resistant. You know, it's, mm. it fades and all that. So, um, there's been a, a conservation effort, and not only that, but in so I think it was 2012. Uh, don't quote me on that, but around in 2012, Mount Vernon started um, displaying the Lafayette apron on President's Day or George Washington's birthday every year. I want to thank our guest for coming back. Uh, I, I'm so I, it slips out almost every single time. Doctor, not brother. Doctor Jason Williams, the author of Brought to Light. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. You're very welcome, Michael. Always glad to be here. If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more, you can tell Siri or Alexa to play the Craftsman Online podcast. We're available on all streaming platforms with new episodes every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Thank you.